Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the ASMBS Bariatric Happy Hour. I am S. Julie Ann Lloyd. Yes, I did say my full name. I'm joined here tonight by um, many other esteemed surgeons. Um, notably, we have Dr. Kenora Jane Spangler, Dr. Laura Fisher, Dr. Adrian Dan, and Dr. Carlos Galvani. Tonight, we will be discussing Sadie Diaz, and our guest speaker is Dr. Rana Pulat, who really needs no introduction when it comes to talking about Sadie and DS, um, but I will tell you a little bit about him. He's a professor of surgery. He is the director of bariatrics and robotic surgery at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, he specializes in forgotten bariatrics, reoperative surgery, and he actually performed the first laparoscopic and robotic duodenal switch in South Carolina. Um, he has performed most of the DSs and Sadies that we've seen at some of the meetings and is known as a very gifted laparoscopic and robotic surgeon. So we're excited to have him show us some videos today and go through some technical pearls that um, any surgeon can benefit from. All right, Dr. Paulette, I know you have a very long bio, but we'll stop there and let you go ahead and start <laughs> talking about your specialty. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate um, the introduction and appreciate being here. I'm gonna try and um, share my screen here. And then I'm just gonna go over what um, I do with my cases and uh, hopefully, you know, we can stir up a discussion. So, um, so my uh, disclosure, I'm a consultant slash proctor for intuitive. Uh, my original training was in liver and kidney transplant in 2001. Uh, my bariatric and foregut practice started in 2008. I started dabbling in robotics in 2010 to 2012. I taught myself how to do robotics using inguinal hernias on an SI. Um, gastric bypass on an SI in 2013. First robotics AD in 2014 using the SI. Uh, now my bariatric practice has transitioned 100% uh, to robotics. Um, I, uh, three years ago, established a division of metabolic and foregut surgery and broke away from um, what was an amorphous GI surgery division. We, um, um, I strongly believe in a very, very um, sound um, background in laparoscopic surgery. Um, till very recently, I used to do the duodenals, which is still about three years ago, I used to do them all laparoscopically. Um, the advantages of robotics for me, uh, the number of complex cases a day has gone up. I, I don't care if I have three type fours um, and then a duodenal switch. Um, it has given me the flexibility to be able to do that. Um, laparoscopically, I think that would be extremely hard to do a day like that. Um, no need for an assistant in a complex case. The um, highest BMI for the primary duodenal switch I've done is a 104. And I've done several 90s males uh, with uh, pretty high visceral obesity. The highest BMI with the primary sleeve we've done is a 107. The uh, traditional training path in MUSC is the chief resident um, who usually scrubs with me, does the sleeve part of the case. Um, completely, you know, by the by the second month of the rotation, they are doing it from placing trocars to docking the robot, unless there's a visitor um, who's come to visit, in which case I do uh, most of the procedure. But they do the sleeve, and then I um, do the duodenal switch part of the procedure. Patient selection, any patient that comes into my clinic with a BMI greater than 50, I entertain a discussion. Um, of a duodenal switch or a SADI, anybody with BMI of greater than 35 with severe diabetes mellitus. Um, if I see someone in the BMI in their 40s and then they have a high degree of visceral obesity, um, you know the you know when you see them, and that's uh, you know if I, in my hands the go-to metabolic operation, which I think if I think there's something more than a sleeve, then I that I then I'll consider a SADI or a DS or severe hyperlipidemia. Operative strategies, we truly believe in pre-op weight loss, um, pre-op very low calorie diet. In some of the bigger patients, you may need a higher insufflation pressure. Um, I do tend to use the air seal generously. I think it helps me. 
occasionally, very occasionally, we do a staged operation in case the mesentery is completely immobile. Um, so when, whenever we place um, the only bariatric procedure that I do with an assistant port um, is the duodenal switch because I use it to put in sutures, take it out, um, put in my Penrose strain, take it out. We've done them with all of the sutures inside. Um, and once we lost like a needle and it was kind of hell. So I, I just do it with an assistant port um, in these bigger patients. Um, it, it, I think it helps me um, if I need some suction, I have the assistant um, do a suction for me. For the gastric bypass and sleeve, obviously you don't need an assistant port. Um, in extreme high BMI patients, if I want to reach the ileocecal junction, I do two additional five millimeter ports. I still count my bowel laparoscopically. Sometimes in big males, the ileocecal junction is pretty stuck down. Um, I still worry about tearing it um, and not getting um, accurate measurements. Um, I, that's just the, been the way I've always done it. I think it works well for me, so I've never felt the need to change. Camera as well to the left of midline, steep reverse Trendlenburg and right tilt for the sleep part in these bigger patients. Obviously in a BMI of 50 or 60, you don't need to do that. You can do about 15 degree reverse Trendlenburg and keep the patient. Um, obviously we have a, a bed that is mated to the robot, so we don't have to double dock, but when we didn't have it, in some of the bigger patients, you may have to double dock and retarget if you don't have table motion. Intraoperative straight strategies, I do a complete inferior du duodenal mobilization, except if I'm converting a ruin by gastric bypass to a CD or a switch, in which case I do kind of a, a limited duodenal mobilization. Um, I'm very generous with ligating the right gastric artery, especially if they have high visceral obesity, because I think uh, when I've done them in the past, um, laparoscopically or robotically, when I did not take the right gastric artery and, and kept trying to do high BMI patients um, in a single stage. I've had leaks, which um, once I started routinely taking the right gastric in those patients and reducing the tension, the leaks gone away. Uh, a mental division is of very limited use. Um, I think it's uh, not as useful as how you would expect it to be in a gastric bypass. I do all my uh, true duodenal switches in an omega loop uh, configuration. So I first construct a SAD and then uh, deconstruct it to make it a, a ruin Y. Uh, very, very rarely retrocolic. Um, that was when I was doing it laparoscopically and not taking the right gastric. Uh, very rarely you may have to mobilize the IC junction and ileal mesentery mobilization. So this is my traditional, um, I use a diamond flex liver retractor, which comes from the right side, uh, which works really well and stays away. And then I use um, two stapler trokers, um, one on the left side and one on the right side. So I'll sleeve using the stapler trocar, and then I use my um, stapler trocar from this side to transect the duodenum. And this is where my assistant port is. It's actually, this diagram is false. It needs to be up here so you can see everything your assistant's doing. And if they need to place suction um, in here, they're able to do it. So this is traditionally uh, the bigger patients. We obviously are very careful about strapping them really well, uh, making sure that they don't um, roll off um, and uh, really kind of uh, keep a close eye on that. This is our um, way in which we put our ports. So the camera port you can see is well um, above the midline in these bigger patients. You wanna be high um, because I already count my bowel um, and tack it up here. So I don't I have no need to be looking down here. Um, my biggest challenge in these bigger patients is completing the sleeve because actually the access to the duodenum is not as bad. It's the high um, sleeve uh, vessels that you get into trouble with. So this is how um, I put my ports in and uh, you can see how high the assistant port is because I think if you put them low, they're kind of useless. So you put it here, you can have them suck around the duodenum when you're doing anastomosis, or if you have a small bleed, you can have them suction that. So this is just um, 
a video first showing my um, uh, setup for the um, for the uh, switch. Uh, the robot comes from this side. I dock it from the left side of the patient, and then laparoscopically, I find the ileocecal junction, and then I count backwards. These are five centimeter marks um, on my thing. And basically what I do is at 100, and, if this is for a traditional duodenal switch, at 125 centimeters, I place two clips. And then I place one clip just proximal so that I know that two clips is towards the IC junction, one clip is towards the uh, ligament of trites. Then I count another 150 centimeters and place one clip and then tack that loop, loop of bowel um, to the um, omentum up there, laparoscopically just uh, suture it and hold, so that it, it's held in place. Uh, this I do before docking. It takes me about five minutes to do this. Um, you, in, in thinner patients, I think it's very easy to look down into the IC junction and, and do it. Then I tell every person who comes to observe me to run that bowel backwards. And you should see one clip first and two clips after the one clip that you see on the same side of the mesentery. If you don't, then you have mixed up somewhere when you were counting the bowel, you've twisted it. So if you don't see the clips on the same side of the mesentery and you don't see one and then two, then you've done something wrong, you have to count it again. So that was in a patient who had less visceral obesity. So I'm gonna show you a case with, uh, with something with the, uh, so this is basically a, a this is again, um, just a, a point on duodenal mobilization, how I do it. And I'll, then I'll show you one case integrated with everything in place. I just lift up with my fourth arm uh, high up. So two arms are coming to the left of the camera and one arm to the right. And then I search in the duodenal pancreatic groove. And once I um, end up in that fusion zone between the duodenum and pancreas, I just spread over there and you can, almost invariably mostly see the gastroduodenal artery. Once you see the gastroduodenal artery, I wanna pause here because this is where the GDA is and you don't want to go past this um, you, because you just end up increasing your risk of peripancreatic fistula, pancreatic leak and increased bleed. So when you're at the duodenum, you have a two to three centimeter cut and that's plenty. And the other thing that people forget to do is to not lift this with arm four high enough and up straight. Because what happens here, if you don't do that, is the duodenum kind of folds on itself and you're not able to get past that area. So the antrum kind of flops here and you're not able to get past. So if you can use this hand to lift it straight up and this hand to kind of tuck this um, area to the left, then you have your vessel sealer here. And if you just work right in the plane of the gastroduodenal artery, the, the, the only thing you're going to hit is maybe these small branches um, and those will stop, but if, even if you hit it, but if you, you know, if you just burn and go little by little, you'll be able to just um, get into that plane. So the, the key is to use this hand to kind of hold the duodenum to the left so you don't have the antrum and the duodenum flopping onto that side so that you have a nice plane so you're getting past that duodenum and staying right on top that, of that GDA. And then once you get into that, you drop this hand, uh, arm four, then you use this hand to kind of lift up and then there you are. You're past the portal structures, you're past where you need to be and then you get a Penrose around it. And then you take the gastroepiploic vessels that come here to your target area in the duodenum. So I build my tunnel and then do this. I think it works really well um, It it uh, in, in any kind of um, obese patient instead of doing an inside to dissection. I think this works really well. And then you have a nice tunnel when you lift it up. And again, the key is to place that stapler, then drop this hand and then straighten out the stapler you can use the Penrose to kind of feed the duodenum and then arm four pulls to the left and you have a good cuff here, well past the pylorus. So that's how you get a nice cuff. So it's a, it's a sequence of movements. And then once I do that, I then take my vessel sealer from the left side and mobilize the superior portion of the duodenum. 
And this is where you can be judicious and people who don't have much visceral obesity, you can stop with just taking some of the superior attachments. If you think that they need more reach, then you can take the right gastric and drop the whole thing down. Um, and most of the times in small, um, you know, in patients with the women with a BMI 50, 60, 70, all that you need to do is take a little superior attachments and then once the duodenum points down, the tension is pretty minimal. So, so now, Rano, quick, uh, yeah. quick question for you. When yes. you're stapling across the duodenum, are you going completely perpendicular or do you staple at an angle? No, I go completely perpendicular. So I straighten out my stapler. So once I get it into that groove, um, I then uh, get it past the duodenum and then I bend my ankle so that, I mean, bend my angle of the stapler so that it's completely perpendicular to the duodenum. And then I use my arm four to pull the stomach towards the spleen so you get lots of duodenum, duodenal cuff. And okay. you'll see that a little bit more, hopefully clearer in this video, um, which is uh, on a higher visceral obesity patient where I put everything together. So this is someone, um, with the BMI in the 80s or 90s, but you can see the abdominal wall is pretty big as well as the liver is big, um, high visceral obesity. We've already tacked the bowel. We get our diamond flex retractor. We make up plane. Um, clearly in a duodenal switch or a SADI patient, the key is to make that sleeve a little bit more generous. Uh, we do a 48 French bougie. The key is, you know, whatever bougie size you use, make sure that you don't make any kinks in the incisor angularis because a combination of um, making your sleeve too narrow and then having malabsorption or hypoabsorption is uh, a real disaster. And the things in developing efficiency is lots of surgeons, when they start off, they're always dropping things and picking it up, dropping things and picking it up. You can keep moving with the vessel sealer and you can do all your um, shifts in your arm, in your left arm, while the vessel seal is working and you don't need to move that other arm. And then when you get high up, it actually helps not to have both, you know, hands, uh, one holding the stomach and one holding the momentum. You're actually better off holding the stomach and splaying it onto the left side. And that really gives you good access to the last bit of short gastrics. So that's the difference I see when my chief resident starts, they're taking, you know, 35, 40 minutes to do a sleeve but when they get the hang of it, they're able to do it in 20, 25 minutes. And the biggest difference is um, the fact that they're not, you know, dropping the, uh, dropping everything that they have every few seconds to readjust um, and then being able to utilize the camera well and drive the camera all the way in. So right now um, you'll see me kind of um, rotate the stomach with my hand and really kind of drive that camera in and get all the last bit of vessels. And then you just go inferior and keep mobilizing. And you can see a pretty big liver, uh, tight space. You do the first fire I always do without a bougie in, and then I trap the bougie and I always kick out my base um, so that I'm not narrowing it. This is a 48 French bougie, so it's a pretty wide sleeve, um, but high up, I try and get all the fundus still, because I think if you leave a, a large amount of fundus, these people end up with bad reflux, the same principles that you would do with the sleeve, and you feed the um, thing into the stapler and you're able to get all of it. And then once you do that, you can, you can readjust the liver retractor. In most cases, you don't have to, but again, the same principles, you go down, find your duodenal pancreatic groove, and usually the gastroduodenal vessel is there in more obese patients. It's less clear, it's beyond a particular amount of fat, but the same thing, the vessel seal is a nice way to dissect it. And once you get it around, the vessel seal is a poor grabber, so you have to intercept that Penrose drain into the vessel sealer to be able to grab it, otherwise it's gonna slip on you. And then see how I get my stapler in? And now I'm changing my angle to make it perpendicular. And then again, you basically just mobilize the top of the duodenum uh, downwards with your vessel sealer now coming from the left side. So my 
general configuration for all four getters, two arms on the left of the camera and one arm on the right of the camera. And this is my tack limb. So I just put a two of vicryl stitch, um, seven inches long to kind of hold the um, ilium in place. And once I have that, I then use a two of V-lock um, to run my posterior layer. Um, this is a nine inch two of V-lock um, absorbable suture. And I've always used it. I think that was a, you know, if I had 3 I would use the 3 but you know, this has always worked. And then this is another learning curve. I think getting the angle right for making your entrotomy so you don't make a counterpuncture, especially on the uh, duodenal side. The ileal side is easier. And then I move my fourth arm to kind of open up that space. And then I do one interrupted stitch right on top, incorporating all four walls, because I think the apex sometimes can roll on you when you do a continuous suture. I used to, when I do it, did I did it laparoscopically, I used to do it in single layer, but with the robot, I just throw the extra layer. I think it reduces um, any kind of bleeding in that anastomosis. Um, it's easier to do with the robot. Um, so then I just use a two of vicryl for the inner stitch um, because I think it has less chance of purse stringing the anastomosis. And then, um, I do a canal stitch right there in the corner and I run it all the way back up. And that two of vicryl is tied to itself um, to that interrupted stitch that I did in the top. And then the two of V-lock that I left inferiorly uh, for the outer layer um, is again taken up all the way back. So if you're doing a SEDI, now you're pretty much done. Uh, that's the size of the anastomosis. As long as an endoscope can get in, you're pretty much done. So a SEDI is done. Um, and you'll see um, with a SEDI, there are people who close it, close the space or don't close the space. I try and close it whenever I can. Um, of course, this is a true duodenal switch. So you can see this patient's got pretty good amount of visceral obesity, but you can still expose that space. Um, sometimes you have to use table motion to get the bowel to lay the way you want. Um, and then there's your transverse mesocolon being lifted. And then this is the view you need to see to close pseudo Peterson space, um, a, especially if you're doing a, a Roux and Vi duodenal switch, because I've seen internal hernias with that. Um, very rare to have it in a SAD, but um, one purse string is good enough to close that space because basically you're stabilizing the base of the mesentery rather than a true space. So once you do that, then you run the um, common channel, uh, sorry, the limb that goes to the common channel or the efferent limb of the loop anastomosis till you see your um, clips at the 125 centimeter mark. As I said, you got to see the one and then the two. So, um, and then once you do that, you rotate the bowel in a, in a way in which it makes sense. You line it up with the afferent limb. You can do a hand-sewn anastomosis here. I've done a hand-sewn with just a single layer, but I like to do um, a stapled anastomosis. I do it two um, fires, usually about 30 millimeter um, fires. So I get it up to about um, 30 millimeters on each side. And once I get to the 30 mark, um, white loads, I think for the ilium, it works well. And then I just kind of hold this up and do a, a fire making an H anastomosis. Once I do that, I take a two of vital stitch and uh, put it right at the apex. And what that allows me to do, this one I'm using an ethibon, but what that allows me to do is lift up that entire anastomosis, and this gives me access to the ilioilial mesentric space. So you close the ilioilial mesentric space um, in these patients. And so now um, you've con completed your entire um, mesentric closure, you've completed your entire um, anastomosis, and now you just convert this omega loop into a rule configuration, and you do that by dividing the uh, afferent limb as it comes into the loop anastomosis. 
with a white load. So there you have the loop 2 denal switch being converted to a rule configuration. And then you take out your specimen. We use, a, I think, a crossbow system to take the thing out. So occasionally, you, 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 you guys, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm interrupting you again. Do you, when you're doing um, the stapling, the separation of the loop, do you ever get the limbs mixed up? Like, how do you keep them straight? Yeah, I mean, I think um, as long as you have it oriented properly, and those are there are little tips. Um, I use a clip to the when I bring the loop up, I I always put a clip to the right, which is the efferent limb, um, so that and I anastomose it uh, proximal to that clip, so I know that if I see the clip onto my onto the patient's right side then that's the efferent limb and the afferent limb is the other one. So it's the way you bring it up. Um, I think the, the way you bring it up is the way, you know, it, it rests. And occasionally you're going to have a patient and you guys have seen it um, in videos um, where you mobilize the duodenum and then you end up with a completely blue duodenum um, which can be blue and black if you take the right gastric artery. But clinically, it's of no significance. If you check it with ICG, it may not light up. Um, first time I did it, I put a bunch of drains in and kept the patient in the hospital for five days. But the patient then left AMA. And uh, we had him, um, we saw him once back for an internal hernia many uh, a year later. And you'll see that the duodenum is as uh, is pink as pink can be, and see you can see how this duodenum looks pretty um, black, and it's got a good line of demarcation when you give ICG, and somehow it still lives off the left gastric artery. So you can see me complete the anastomosis or complete the posterior line of the anastomosis, and then when you give ICG, you'll see the perfusion kind of stop. Um, proximal to it. And so I do, uh, after that, I never now check with ICG because I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to check it because if you're not going to use it. So you can see it's a clean line of demarcation right there. Um, but we continued on and despite all of this because of the Brazilian experience of it being good. Um, so I say just, you know, generously take it, you can see how almost bluish black that looks. Um, and then you finish your anastomosis. And you can see this is a year later, that same patient came in for an internal hernia and you can see how that looks. Same exact patient. Wow. So we have um, we have a question from the audience, and actually, I do want to remind all of our attendees that you guys are welcome to uh, submit questions whenever. You don't have to wait until the end, and the panelists can also ask questions whenever. But let me take yeah, one. Yeah, that's from all the I have. Or... So yeah, I'm happy to take. Oh, any... <laughs> okay. Then we'll just talk right now. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question is from Dr. Pandio. Sorry if I'm butchering your name, but what do you use to mark your laparoscopic instruments? You said that you put something at the five centimeter yeah, increment. The least. Yeah, I've, I've asked uh, MESC several times to give me, you know, like good marking graspers. Somehow they give us robots, but you know, you, if you want something that's cheap, it's almost impossible to get. Um, so I just use a steady strip. Um, just take a steady strip and it's low key. You just wrap it around a few times. Remember, it won't go through a five millimeter trocar. It'll strip it. So when you put it, you know, uh, that's the only thing. So if you're putting an extra thigh somewhere, that it may have some resistance to go, but through the robot trocars, it goes in easy. My biggest mistakes um, in duodenal switch surgery have been um, not the duodenal dissection, but my biggest mistakes have been limb lengths. There have been patients in my first um, several that I've had to go back and increase their common channel because I would I would try to wing it like how I do a gastric bypass, eyeball it. 
it doesn't work for a duodenal switch because I think the margins for error are so little. So there's a huge difference between 250 centimeters and 300 centimeters. I've gone back on a patient, one of my early cases, where I had just 200 centimeters. So the patient, you know, had tremendous weight loss, but then her liver functions were going crazy. So I took her back um, and when I really measured her, it was 200 centimeters of total bowel length between the um, common channel and the thing. So my biggest mistakes have been bowel length. I think um, being generous with bowel length is probably better, especially when you start out. I had a question for Rana, Julie, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Absolutely, you guys can. Great, great videos, Rana. I really enjoyed um, you. your videos as usual. Um, you know, I was surprised to see that uh, you have migrated to 100% robotics and bariatric cases, like you said. And I know you have been doing robotics for a while, but I didn't know that now um, it's almost uh, all you do. Uh, yeah. So I wonder what motivated that. So the other thing I wanted to ask you, going to the the point on on counting the bowel, do you count? from TI to LT, every duodenal switch, uh, I know you didn't show it in the video, but is that the must for you or you just not? Uh... No, I, I um, so I'll do the second one first. Um, I do not count TI to ligament of trites. Um, and I think there's some good signs to it. I've got uh, a Japanese guy coming um, from Yosuke Seiki and uh, Kazunora Kasama, they do, sleeve DJBs on Japanese patients on much lower BMIs and seem to have pretty decent results. They call it sleeve DJB, but they measure the entire length of the bowel and they have a formula um, that they've come up with um, as to how many um, of the, how much of percentage of bowel should be thing. So we have the um, Yosuke coming in for the ASMBS main session to kind of tell us what they, what they do. But I think um, I, I can tell you that I get into less trouble with Sadie uh, when I have 300 centimeters of total bowel length. I'm yet to take a patient for a Sadie back where I've given 300 centimeters of bowel length. Um, that seems like a safe uh, place to be. With the duty and I'll switch every now and then you'll have a patient that uh, with the traditional DS, every now and then you'll have a patient that you end up having to take back and give them another 50 to 100 centimeters of bowel. I don't know why. And maybe the answer is what you're saying, Carlos, that maybe we should be measuring the entire bowel and come up with certain portions or fractions. Um, I don't know if you if we end up making mistakes. So if you ask Antonio Torres, because this results for Sadie's in my hands on super, super high BMI patients have been underwhelming compared to uh, the traditional DS. So if somebody comes to my clinic with a 90, 95 BMI, I'm still giving them a traditional DS. But if you ask Antonio Torres, he'll tell you that his first series of um, 50 or 100 patients that they did, they were doing 250 centimeters of common channel on the Sadie, and they had excellent weight loss but their reoperation rate was much higher. They were had almost 15 to 20% of the patients had to be reoperated and given extra bowel length. But if they did a subset analysis, they found that the higher BMIs tolerated that 250 centimeter SADI. So I don't know if we should be doing it more aggressively and still be doing a SADI. But the answer is I don't measure it. I measure just 300, I measure 300 centimeters for a SADI. If they're slightly on the bigger side, I'll go to 275 for a SADI. But with my Ruan by DS configuration, I stick to 125 with 150 for a total bowel length of 275. I try not to go below that. Rana, I think one thing that's important to point out for the fellows, you know, we're in the boat, same boat where like at least once a year, somebody ends up taking back a DS because we have to lengthen limbs. And and often we find that they're not what they were reported. And so I yeah. do think it's important to point out that we're measuring bowel not on stretch and we're measuring it uniformly. And I think that's one of the most important things that you do at the beginning and middle of your fellowship is really learn how to run bowel and measure it really well in a way that you're confident with your measurements. Yeah. 
And for the first question, Carlos, I think it was just um, some sort of pride, reluctance, some sort of fear that I'm going to handle the duodenum badly if I do it with the robot. Um, I'm now about 1,700 cases robotic overall. I will never uh, again in my life do a duodenal switch laparoscopically if I don't have to. Uh, same with uh, any parasophageal hernia. I, I won't. You know, it's just so much easier. I think it's just... Um, it, it's just somebody, it, it just takes a lot of cases for someone to realize what the robot can do and how fluid it can get and how, um, you know, people don't believe it, but I really am telling you that my console time for a SADI in, in not a very difficult patient is about 40 minutes. That's 35 to 40 minutes you can do a SADI. It takes about 13, 14 minutes to do the sleeve and the rest of it is your anastomosis. Granted, I spend five minutes in the initial part laparoscopically uh, measuring my bowel. In a full duodenal switch, it takes about 50, 55 minutes to do your second anastomosis. I could never, you know, if I'm, I, I considered myself a very good laparoscopic surgeon, but I was never near any of those times um, laparoscopically. I, I think, there are very gifted laparoscopic surgeons who, you know, and I, I could throw a stitch from the left side with a long needle driver and a BMI of 90 in any angle I wanted. But to be honest, there, I was nowhere near these times, if I had to be completely honest. Um, the visualization is just phenomenal. Um, the ability to really control the entire operative field and the fact that, you know, I did two type fours and then another hiatal hernia with a, uh, with a uh, Heller myotomy and a SAD all in the same day. And laparoscopically, I can tell you I'd be gassed um, by the end of it. Um, so I think I'm able to do more cases a day, more consistently. Um, and I've asked myself the question, am I just you know, so into the robotic thing now that I'm forgetting how easy it was to do laparoscopically. I still think that a straightforward laparoscopic sleeve in patients with not a high degree of abdominal wall obesity um, is going to be probably quicker in most people's hands than doing it robotically. But even for a sleeve, if somebody's got very high visceral obesity or, you know, a really difficult, challenging liver or a challenging abdominal habitus, I can tell you that it's a lot easier to do the sleeve uh, robotically. So uh, the only thing that prevents, um, I think most surgeons from adopting the platform is access and the fact that it costs uh, a lot. Um, and I think- um, So not ego. Yeah. <laughs> I think the ego is there because we are a, we are a field we're not gynecologists, we're not urologists. We have operations that we can do laparoscopically, right? We are, we are a very, very select group of surgeons who do the most complex laparoscopic surgeries. And we are probably the last generation that trained that way, that could do laparoscopic um, cases. So it's, it's, it's also reluctance to give up that hard-earned field um, but I can tell you that I would have, I, I, can, I can get a fifth year chief resident in my program, a well-trained fifth year chief resident in my program, do a safe robotic gastric bypass. I could not say that with a laparoscopic gastric bypass. I can give them, I, I, I don't scrub in on my sleeves um, if, I, if I have a good chief resident, I stand, and they put in the ports, they dock the robot, they go sit and do the case. Same with gallbladders. I cannot say the same. Maybe I'm a failed um, laparoscopic teacher, but I think the platform um, really shortens that learning curve in MIS. Uh, is it more expensive? Yes, it's it's horrendously more expensive, but um, what, what, you know, Abhi, as a field, should we be saying, you know, only I can only, I want to make 
the superstar laparoscopic surgeons, and you know it's not reproducible. You know you're not going to have those superstar laparoscopic surgeons everywhere. So what, what happens? In small rural Orangeburg, you have, a sur you have a surgeon who can't do something laparoscopically, and so that patient ends up with a big open incision, and you end up giving the robot, and that patient actually has MI surgery. You're never going to get that patient from Orangeburg to come to Charleston, even though it's a one-hour drive, to come and see a gifted laparoscopic surgeon. So we cannot, we have, we have failed in the last 40 years in being able to do that. We're not going to put superstar laparoscopic surgeons in every nook and corner. But I feel yeah. my residents go out, have the robotic platform, and they're able to do, like two of my residents went to some rural community in, in, in South Carolina, and they've changed the entire landscape of MI surgery in that community. And they don't have good assistance. They don't have, you know, they have a robot and they're able to do it. Is it more expensive? Yes, but you know, that's probably because we have um, one company that, you know, is very clever and extremely innovative and they are market leaders. So you don't know what the cost of actually making the robot is. Could they make, they sell it at $2.1 million. Could they make uh, a huge profit by selling it a, at a million dollars? We don't know that because there's no real market pressure for them to do that. It's just like the Apple iPhone, right? At least they have Samsung to compete. But what's the actual cost of the making an iPhone? Is it a $200 and is Apple selling it to us for 800 or 900, could they make a good enough profit at 600? We don't know the answer to that. And even less so um, in the surgical robotic world, because there's one company that and does it, and they, they are reaping the benefits of being innovators and, and being in this field. So that's You're my- You're absolutely take right about that, Rana. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I uh, I agree with you. I think that this is kind of the way of the future, you know, um, trying to figure out how to get all of these different types of surgeries that we're doing on a robot more accessible to the patients who are out in the community. Um, and you're right, the robot is definitely one way to do it, um, but it may not be accessible for everybody right now. And hopefully in the future that will change. Um, I do want to um, get to some of the other questions because we have a ton of questions. You did such a great job that people are asking you all sorts of things. Um, so one from the audience from Dr. Dowdy, uh, do you enforce the duodenal stump? And have you ever seen any cases in which there was a blowout of it? Um, so luckily never. Um, I've done a few hundred of these duodenal switches. I've never had a duodenal blowout. So I think it's the complication is more um, spoken of than seen. Um, I think it's a very safe operation. It's very well perfused. Um, and if you don't really burn up the duodenum, I don't see it happening, but I do not reinforce the duodenal stump. I use staple line reinforcement um, very um, occasionally on renal patients, on patients that I think are high cardiac risk that need to go back on Plavix, those kind of patients, but routinely I don't use staple line reinforcement. And Rana, just Adrian, Dan, I just want to... First, congratulate you on a wonderful presentation, some very nice videos. And I want to ask you a little bit of a philosophical question as to how your practice and our practices overall have evolved and where do you see it going into the future? So I'm a guy who trained on gastric bypass, did it for 15 years laparoscopically, and much like you, I've changed my algorithm over the last couple of years, doing a lot more sleeves, <clears throat> doing SADS robotically, and doing very little gastric bypass now. I really can't find a good role for it with the exception of some patients with severe GERD, Barrett's, et cetera, or somebody in their 60s who's not going to start smoking now that just needs the one operation and that's it. But I just want to hear how, how the advent of this new technology and of these new operations have changed your overall algorithm in addition to what you already mentioned in the lecture, the BMI of 50 and, and the diabetes. And the other thing that I could, the other component of my question is, um, 
why why a one stage procedure on a BMI of 104 or in the 90s? I think we're catering too much to the insurance companies who say one and done, or patients who say I only want one operation when we know it's a chronic disease and we're putting that patient at higher risk, regardless of whether it's done robotically or laparoscopically. So I want to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, thanks, Adrian. Great questions. And um, I think you're absolutely right. My go-to metabolic operation has now become the SADI um, compared to the gastric bypass, because if we are really, uh, we really take, you know, we, we, it was the elephant in the room, right? Uh, when you see gastric bypass patients coming back five years later or six years later with almost all their weight put on or, um, you know, getting there, we always said, oh, it's your fault. It's your um, problem. You know, you did something wrong. Um, instead of looking at it and saying that, you know, the metabolic effect of that operation has gone away and physiology cannot be beaten by willpower. And if you have a susceptible population, which is where we should look at obesity as somebody who has some sort of genetic metabolic susceptibility and an environment that um, kind of uh, fuels it, then that person is doomed to obesity no matter what they do. So you have a metabolic effect of the operation that's um, gone bad. And you, you know there's a physiologic reason in some patients there's huge glycemic swings and they chase it with carbohydrates. And that's what ha ends up happening with the gastric bypass. So absolutely, I agree with you. I think uh, the SADI has very good evidence, 15 years, um, I'm sorry, um, duodenal switch has very good evidence from the Montreal group long-term, um, as well as Sadi from the Spain group, um, which also physiologically, there's not those glycemic swings. So I think it's going to be a durable operation in the long run. Um, and no, with the Sadi especially, you're not worried about an internal hernia. It's extraordinarily rare. Um, ulcers are very infrequent. Strictures almost never because you have the antrum. Um, so it's, uh, I think if you have to design a perfect metabolic op operation, that's probably the SADI. And I think it's uh, the, the robotic technology has elevated it to be accessible to surgeons um, at all levels. So, you know, a fellow could come out um, and do a SADI um, laparoscopically, maybe very few programs train people enough to be able to do a laparoscopic SADI or duodenal switch in their first year. But with a robotic platform, I think that's very possible. I have you know, people um, all, all around me who are first year fellows doing it on the robot platform. It's very rare to see people doing it on the laparoscopic platform. So I think you know, um, you're absolutely right. And now with the added um, thing of medications and everything else. I think we we have to uh, give them um, the operation that they require. Now, for the other question, why do it in single stage? Um, for us, it's insurance, um, and you're absolutely right. Um, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be catering to that. But you know, when I look at a patient and I see them that they are going to get one operation and that's it. Um, I try my best to do it. Obviously I won't do anything which is unsafe. Um, and, but I try and do it because, because of that. Now I do have seen some patients that have done sleeves on and then I take them back. If I take them back quick enough at six months to a year, then yes, you can do the second part of the operation it makes at least that visceral part of obesity lower. But if you lose that window and they've, they've put their weight back on, you're back to square one. And then you have less of a metabolic chance of fixing it because I think conversion of a sleeve to SADI has less weight, has, has less weight loss than a primary SADI if you started off with one. Um, so I think it's insurance company uh, related um, in our practice. And from a patient standpoint, we are so um, accustomed to saying, oh, you know, we'll just do it in two stages. But it is a huge uh, drain on the patient's resources. Um, it's a huge inconvenience for the patient. Um, 
if it's possible to do it in one, and if you can do it safely, I think that should be the way to do it. Um, that's just my way of thinking about it. How do you decide who gets a SADI versus who gets a DS? So I've been um, more and more, I think, you know, even up to a BMI 60, 70, I will go with the SADI. Um, in my hands, beyond that, the results of a SADI have not been that great, but maybe what Antonio is telling me that, you know, do it more aggressively, do the common channel, don't do 300, do 250, maybe the answer. So I've been trying to do that. Um, I just have to see how that all pans out in the super, super obese. But for me, a BMI of 70 and above, I'll start talking to them about potentially a traditional DS. It also depends on, you know, if it's an African-American woman with a bunch of um, ectopic, like, you know, uh, they're, not, they don't, they're not necessarily very viscerally obese. I might consider a Sadie compared to uh, a Hispanic male with the huge amount of visceral obesity, I might consider a traditional DS. So it's, a, I think we are still in the infancy of trying to figure out because clearly a sleeve works really well in some patients, a ruin by works clearly well in some patients, and a SADI works really well in some patients. We're, we're at almost like, you know, the mastectomy stages of breast cancer. We don't have a genetic test. We don't have anything that guides us other than our intuition. Um, BMI is a poor indicator. So I don't go by BMI, I go by how they look, uh, where their obesity is, um, and what kind of operation should I be giving them. So if I should look at them and I think they have high amount of visceral obesity, then I'm going to give them something which is more metabolic. Do you have issues oh. with long-term? Oh, sorry. I just you want to really okay. quickly say, um, I think also we intuitively now, those of us that are have been doing SADI or DS for a little while, um, I think it's in our intuition that the more complex the procedure, the more um, I expect of the patient. I think that's an important thing to point out. Somebody else wrote, you know, I'm worried my bariatric patients and most of the DS and SADI patients will not follow up beyond two years. You know, how do you handle that? And I think that really is a huge conversation up front that we need to um, have with our patients and we need to make sure that they are aware um, and have been thoroughly educated from a financial standpoint from, you know, every aspect of malabsorption, malnutrition, uh, diarrhea, all of the side effects that they could experience down the road, they're going to need some pretty intense follow-up. And I think that's a key, key defining factor for me as well with that decision. Yeah, absolutely. But um, what I want to point out is that we also should not be this, you know, blinded to the fact that we do gastric bypass in a lot of patients. And a lot of patients don't have very good follow-up. And a gastric bypass is just as dangerous uh, in my mind as a SADI. You know, you have huge problems with anemia, you have huge problems with secondary hyperparathyroidism. So I think in my mind, if you would consider a sleeve, that's a different aspect. But if you can, if you are, going down the path of a bypass, then I think a SADI is just as, just as uh, intensive to follow as a bypass should be. So if you think that somebody could qualify for a bypass, then I, in my mind, they should be able to go for a SADI. Because I think we, we just underestimate how much a bypass requires follow-up. And a lot of these patients, if you see them, they're anemic, they have hyperparathyroidism issues. We just tend to normalize it. We're just starting to do SADIs and DSs uh, at my institution. And we are, <clears throat> we have a very large uh, Medicaid population, which kind of feeds into this concern about being able to afford vitamins and, and follow up. How do you guys handle kind of globally who have way more experience than us insurances that cover the DS and specifically exclude Sadie? Yeah, I think DS, I, I think the well-insured people go to Duke. You know, we get the Medicaid population of the Carolinas. Isn't that right, Kunor? <laughs> no, but- um, I'm gonna disagree with Medicaid. you on that one. <laughs> 
we have a huge Medicaid population too. Um, yeah, I think it's um, it's it's kind of funny, but when you talk to the insurance company and tell them, so I I never bill anything which is a SADI as a duodenal switch. I bill it under the unlisted code, right? Um, and they're okay about that. Um, I think I think when you bill, bill it as a duodenal switch is when they get um, kind of tied into all that lingo and language. Um, so I bill it as an unlisted procedure, but I suspect you're probably under an RVU model like most people are. Uh, I'll tell you what you need to do is to negotiate with your whoever is paying you, not, not paying your hospital, but paying you uh, an RVU value for that procedure. Because if you don't, unlisted laparoscopic procedures, at least in, in my Medicaid world of patients, end up being 16 RVUs. And you don't want to be doing the procedure for 16 RVUs. So um, I talked to the guys, you know, who are determining that in my hospital as to how many RVUs it was. And I said, this is worth 32 RVUs. I don't care how you bill it um, and the back end. That's not my problem. Like, you want to bill it as unlisted laparoscopic procedures? Sure, go ahead, because that's the safest thing for hospitals to do. And they don't want to get into trouble with Medicaid and Medicare. But on my end, um, I think I need my fair end of RVUs. Because for the first couple of years, I was getting 16 RVUs for not just for CDs, for duodenal switches, for bypass to duodenal switches, which I was doing at single stage, I used to get 16 RVUs. But you're saying now you're getting 32? 32. That's still low, that's still low right? Well, I mean, that's, that's the RVU uh, value for DS, for an open DS. If you look at an RVU calculator, it's 32 RVUs is what um, an open DS is worth. So actually earlier this month, um, ASMBS had a webinar. Um, I think it was on Valentine's Day or around then about how to code for Sadie DS. Um, I think that is probably a useful resource. We had a bunch of people showing us how to break it down. I don't remember how many RVUs, but I think it was more than 32 that they ended up saying that they, you could get credited for. So you okay. might be underselling yourself a little bit, Rana. Yeah, but I think it's all about the negotiations with the people that that you work with. Um, how do you negotiate it um, and how much are they willing to give? Um, so definitely it's an improvement from 16. <laughs> yeah, because I think they go by how much that procedure actually collected. Um, and that's how they come up with their RVU, sele RVU selection. Um, that's how they come up with it, but you know, I, I'll take anything more than sixteen. So, um, so right. just a couple of questions on here. Sorry, go ahead, Adrian. I was just going to ask you a quick question uh, because a few years ago you wrote a, an awesome editorial on how you know we talked a little bit about Sadie and how important it is to offer this procedure and how important the robotic platform is in being able to offer it, but. Um, you know, the cost is certainly an issue, and you've written on that. With the advent of other companies entering the market, how do you think that will play out in the future? I mean, I think Intuitive is a very smart company, right? I mean, they are not going to kill the golden goose. They know they have the market. They know they are market leaders. Uh, they have been, um, you know, very good at partnering um, but if they see that a hospital, like I tell them, you know, going after the acute care surgeon and, and fighting battles so that the acute care surgeon can do an appendectomy in the middle of the night with a robot um, may not be their, their best strategy to win over hospital administration. Um, if it's available, fine. But I, I, think, I think at some point, when competition comes, they are going to have to show value where they're going to have to increase the number of uses um, of their instruments. Uh, the number of staple fires, for example, you know, it's 15 fires right now. In reoperative surgery cases, sometimes you may need more than that and you end up opening another stapler, which, is, which feels kind of criminal. Um, 
So I think the company will evolve um, because right now there's no market pressure for them to. There's, you know, everything in the horizon seems like uh, a very distant um, kind of competition. It doesn't even seem like uh, the real deal. Um, everything I've tried um, doesn't seem to measure up. Um, I think Medtronic has a pretty decent product, but it's nowhere near prime time um, to be brought into this country. I think it'll take another year. I think there are some pilot institutions like Duke that are going to get systems put in, but it's just going to take some more time. Um, and this company has done amazingly well in training people and getting used to their ecosystem. That's going to take something really special or people thinking outside the box to, to even get something um, remotely close. And I think Carlos's point about ego is very, very important um, about you know the old guard still trying to hang on to laparoscopic surgery. Um, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, it's a very hard learned skill. I don't want to give it up. You know, I used to be a liver transplant surgeon or fellow in 2001, and we would do liver transplants on pediatric liver transplants. And at that time, they would come in with INRs of six and seven, and you had to do plasmapheresis to get them ready for the liver transplant. So you'd get a call at two o'clock in the morning that the kid is there. And as a fellow, you had to go in using anatomic landmarks, stick a big central line into this kid's uh, neck and get access and freeze them, right, with an INR of seven. You did it all by anatomic landmarks, you know. So it was a pride thing, it was a skill thing, but is it the safest thing to do? Um, so right now, that time, the transplant surgeons were the only people who would do it. Right now, um, you know, so many people put in central lines in the hospital. Is it more expensive to have an ultrasound? Sure it is, but what has increased is the number of people who can do it. So I think we've got to see it in that way. Um, the ultimate, the center of this debate needs to be the patient first. If you can deliver care to someone in, in a rural uh, place in, um, in South Carolina or in Montana, and that patient can get as much of good care as they can get in uh, Johns Hopkins or Duke, um, then you've done it. You've, you've, you, you know, I think the cost is worth it. Unless we have a very good way of putting out laparoscopic surgeons who can do it in every corner of the country, but we've not been successful doing that. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say, I know um, I lost my train of thought. So there are a couple other questions in the chat. Um, I apologize ahead of time um, that I don't think we're actually going to get to them because it's already past the owl. Um, but Rana, you were raising some really good points, and I think that we can continue this conversation um, probably offline. Um, but I wanted to thank you so much for coming on tonight to show us how you do your DS and CD. Um, I think this was really um, enlightening for a lot of us, and I think it encourages us most. Uh, like when I was going through fellowship, I remember there was some concern about whether or not DS would be um, something that you know all surgeons would be able to do. And honestly, you make it look easy. Um, but we're happy to, to watch your videos today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Um, thanks to everybody else on the panel who showed up and to the attendees who logged in. Um, and again, I apologize we didn't get through everybody's questions, but we're just really excited to see what you had to show us tonight. Um, the next session of our bariatric happy hour will happen on March 23rd. It's going to be a journal club. And what's the topic, Laura? Do you remember? We're going to have Phil Shower uh, here discussing the CMP trial. So it'll be awesome. Great. So um, you guys come back again. That It's the same time, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, again, thanks to Rana for joining us tonight. You guys have a good night. Thank well, you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Great job, Rana.